Using the information presented in this video, you will be able to make an aluminum casting in a single afternoon with a little luck. Hi, I'm David Wimberly. Welcome to Groucho's Garage. In my previous video, Molasses Bonded Sand Part 1, I just laid out the basics. In this video, I'm going to help you produce a legitimate aluminum casting in the easiest possible way. This video is really for the hardcore, impatient, attention deficit viewer, that is, someone like me, who really wants to get into this and see what it's all about. So this time I'm going to give you just enough additional information to make your first casting. We'll talk about crude and simple methods for making furnaces and flasks, but the real star of the show is, as always, the sand you will be able to make some fully functional foundry sand. The ingredients for the sand are easy to find and mix and making a mold with it is straightforward. You may not end up being able to make a casting in an afternoon, but the total amount of time required will be quite small. Once you have an overview of what is required, you may want to do a little preparation in advance such as obtaining and possibly washing the sand and making sure you have all of the ingredients and tools you'll need, especially the fire bricks for the furnace and a means of providing forced air. If you can find a bag of fairly fine washed sand, you're way ahead of the game. But if you start with somewhat contaminated sand, you may want to wash and dry it before mixing it with molasses. Washing the sand is like rinsing rice. Just add plenty of water, mix it, and pour off the cloudy water. Repeat this until the water is clear. Now I have experimented with masonry sand and other impure sand, and you can probably work with whatever sand you have. On the other hand, you're more likely to be successful with washed sand. The formula is 7 parts blackstrap molasses from the grocery store to 100 parts dry sand by weight. Mix all of the molasses with one third of the sand and then add the remaining sand and mix it thoroughly. If the humidity is low enough, just spread the sand out and let it dry somewhat. Otherwise, you can dry some of the sand in an oven and then mix it all together until you get a workable consistency. If you squeeze a handful of sand, it shouldn't leave much on your palm. A flask consists of two containers without tops or bottoms. Normally, some alignment hardware is used, but we're doing away with that. We're just going to cut a couple of rings from tin cans or plastic containers for the flask and for alignment we'll use witness marks and masking tape along with intentional depressions in the lower mold. Sheet metal screws will keep the sand from rotating in the round containers. Tools for preparing a mold can be made from such things as bolts, dowels, tubing and metal strapping. For parting, use table sugar pulverized in a blender or ground ginger or turmeric. This is not a how-to on foundry safety. If you're not confident in your ability to build a furnace or melt aluminum or handle the molten metal, you should figure out how to do that before you fire up a furnace. I will mention a few things, however. Protective gear such as a face mask, a dust mask, heavy boots, and gloves should be used. Also, to avoid explosions, preheat metal before adding it to the crucible and don't work on concrete. If you want a safer and easier alternative to aluminum, you can use a zinc alloy which can be melted with a propane torch. In one of my clips you'll see I've made an extremely crude furnace with just a few fire bricks, some 4-inch stovepipe, and a wire to hold things together. That demonstrates what can be done in a pinch, but you may want to spend a little more time making your furnace. If you want to make a furnace that is sure to melt aluminum, get some fire bricks in advance, prepare some mud to seal the bricks, and use soft wire to reinforce the structure as needed. The furnace will be a sort of chimney 
with an air inlet at the bottom and a hole down the middle that's just big enough to accommodate your crucible. Charcoal briquettes can be used for fuel. The forced air can come from an old vacuum cleaner or a hair dryer with a cool setting. Use a motor controller to adjust the flow. There are lots of things that can be used as crucibles, but I'm going to recommend the use of a ready-made stainless steel container. You'll see me use the bottom of a propane bottle, but I'll let you figure out how to do that safely if you choose to. Keep in mind that if you burn through a crucible or spill aluminum, you can be badly injured. A pyrometer is very handy, but perhaps overkill. Make sure the aluminum is hotter than the melting point. Once you melt the last bit of material added to the pot, let it continue to heat for a while. The molten metal in the mold cavity will ruin the adjacent sand by carburizing the molasses. Therefore, as soon as the casting is strong enough not to be destroyed, break down the mold and scrape the good sand away from the casting and set the casting aside. It will continue to burn the molasses in the sand that's stuck to it. After the casting is thoroughly solidified, you can knock off the remaining sand. I'm starting out with a piece of four inch galvanized pipe, stove pipe, with a flap cut in it and using masking tape to attach a steel tube for the introduction of air. Previously, I've made a bed of fire brick. It's as though I was required to do this in an afternoon because I spent all of about five minutes or maybe less doing this. I've got four bricks and then I'll put a little spacer brick in that first brick. Now I'm wrapping it with one loop of wire and you'll see me turn it clockwise to tighten it up and once that's done i'll put a z in it to make it a little tighter there we go we're going to make some flasks out of either tin cans or vitamin containers here's a nice tin can tahini can you could leave the bottom in as the drag for some of these operations but normally you'd have to remove it to get a straight line wrap a piece of paper around the plastic bottle and align the edges and then draw your nice straight line. We're going to have to cut this. We could use these tin snips, modern tin snips. We could also use a hot butter knife heated with a propane torch or the ubiquitous utility knife. A bit laborious, but effective. I think a cutoff saw would be actually probably the easiest way to go. I'm marking, this is smart, my witness marked while it's still together. I should have labeled cope and drag as well at that time. Here's me using a utility knife out of the camera and my girlfriend magnet attached to tin snips cutting off the top. So once these have been cut off, we'll have our completed flask without the labels or the there's a label, drag and cope. Cope being the top as in cap or kappa. And here is a sheet metal screw going in. These are actually self-drilling screws. So I've got four screws, two in each side there and a completed flask. Now we're moving on to the metal flask. These can be cut with tin snips or with a cutoff wheel, which is a little easier and the edge is going to be sharp so i'm protecting myself by putting some masking tape in place now i'll be mating two cans top to top and once i've done that i'll put the witness marks in there and label them and then add screws and once the screws are added we have another flask that includes a cope and a drag I'm doing something a little excessively complicated here. I'm using a couple of bamboo skewers. One of them holds the pattern at the right attitude and the other one supports the uh, flask. In the meantime, outside of the camera, I've dusted it with parting 
and now I'm adding sand and I'm going to just build this up until I get to the bottom of the drag because it's inverted. Just bring it up level. This will take a few iterations using my fingers, my thumbs, and I'm removing a little bit of debris there. And then a roller, and a rammer, side of the rammer. And you don't necessarily need to use all of these tools, but in this case, that's what I'm doing. And finally, I'm going to roll it. So once that's done, I can invert the whole thing. And I'm going to use another board to do that just to support it because it's not that well supported. It does have some ribs and so forth, as well as these sheet metal screws. Now we're going to just scrape off the excess sand that sort of squeezed out of there and is proud of where we want it to be. We want it to be level with the top of the drag. So we're just using a piece of strapping here and removing all that stuff. And then I'll use my thumbs here to compress the material, make sure that nothing is loose and we'll be ready to move on from there. Okay, I'm pointing at where I'm going to gate that. I'll put the sprue there. But in the meantime, I'll put some alignment divots or depressions in three places. And then I'll consolidate those little depressions. And that will help the two halves of the mold align with one another. Now I'm blowing off any loose stuff, dusting with parting, and we're preparing to put the cope on top. This is an alternate method of ramming up the drag. It's vertical, it's right side up. We're just gonna use the regular iterative method of filling it up. It's gonna be an empty or at least a uh, patternless drag initially. And once we've got it rammed up and make sure it's adequately consolidated, we'll just place the pattern on there, no parting. I knew it would work like this, so I didn't put any parting and then just press it in and consolidate around the edges. And in order to extract it, just invert it. Here we go. Boom. Perfect. And look at that nice impression. Here's a little aside. This is what happens when you let it sit for a day at 40% humidity. It becomes very rigid and tough. The sand is crunchy. I can hit it with a ball peen hammer. I can't break the sand out of this drag. Now I'm putting the sand back in the container and then I'll add the drag back in there and then rehydrate it with just a little bit of water, put the top on it and in a day it'll be usable again. Now we'll return to our regular procedure. The drag has been prepared and dusted with parting. Now it's time to install the cope. Use the alignment marks. First, tack it with a small piece of tape and then use a longer piece of tape to secure it. And this gives it a lot of security, believe it or not. Now we place a solid wooden sprue and we'll dump some sand in. And after we've dumped a couple loads of sand in, we'll start consolidating it and that portion will be sped up. So using my thumbs now, adding more sand, using a rammer, and then the side of the rammer, checking for hardness, adding a little sand where it needed it, continuing to consolidate, wiggling the thing, scooping out a little funnel and then refining the hole with that uh, rod, rolling it. Here I'm further refining the hole and I'm going to remove the masking tape, all of this uh, to get the pattern out. And the first thing I'll do is wiggle this just a little bit side to side and front to back. 
and then lift it straight up and invert the cope and the cope looks good I've got to put an end gate here and unfortunately all I seem to have at hand is a butter knife not the best tool but I'm cleaning out a trough there consolidating the material and now blowing it off I've got to get this out here I could just invert this drag but I'm messing around with it using some masking tape that loosened it up a bit now I'm pulling it out by hand and everything's okay but there's a little ridge there and I'll knock that down and consolidate it I'm pointing at the witness marks they'll be used to realign the two halves as well as the alignment divots so carefully setting it down now it's in place taping it and this is ready to go out to the furnace to be poured here's our crude furnace it looks like I have something other than charcoal maybe wood in there burning as well I'll remove the crucible with one pair of vice grips and pick it up with a more suitable one for pouring and I'll push the dross back a bit and the pouring doesn't look too auspicious here I'm taking my time now we'll remove the masking tape and it does turn out that that screw is hot the sheet metal screw that's closest to the casting so I'll destroy part of the cope here make it easy to remove remove it and then I'll begin scraping the sand away from the casting once I've done that I'll remove the casting and let it sit for a while to further carburize the adhered sand in the meantime I'll reclaim the undamaged sand push that aside now here we are it sat for a while breaking off the carburized material and so far it's revealing a good casting the casting looks good the surface is a little rough I think the sand was a bit too wet other than that it looks fine here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the pattern and the casting the casting looks good a little rough but completely serviceable if you decide to try to make a casting with this method I wish you the best of luck and will try to respond to anyone who leaves a comment may the swarf be with you in a YouTube video it's good to be young and dynamic but it's really okay to be old the trick oh how about that <laughs> In a YouTube video, it's good to be young and dynamic, but it's really okay to be old. The trick is in not looking as though you died sometime last week, and that, I've found, is harder than you may think.